to start the uh, the conversation, let me just say a couple of words, and then I'll I'll, I'll pose up a, a, a question. I suppose it's about authentic leadership. It, it's it flows directly from the kinds of ideas that, that Sarah and Siggy have been putting forward about the management of, of the human resource, if we call it that. One, one question might be, how is it that our organizations are less adaptive, less creative, and less inspirational than we are as individuals? Now, that may not be true, of course, of some of uh, the organizations represented in this room, but my experience is that that is by and large true, certainly more than 60% of the cases. Uh, often, organizations actually subtract uh, value from the individuals that comprise them. And there is a, a real issue around what's wrong uh, with the workplace as it exists and how we can make it more human, more engaging, more productive, and what the role of the leader is in this. So that's, I, I guess, the start question is, what is the role of the leader in re-engaging the humanity of the human beings who work with us and for us? Let us start, if we may, with those who haven't had a chance to say anything. Helen, would you like to kick off this conversation? Well, I think from my own point of view, we've, uh, in the organisation I work for, we've been through quite a, a, a significant journey of, of change in terms of the way that we do procurement and, and you know, that manifesting itself into a wider attitude of, of, of a, a more commercial uh, approach to the way that we do things and I think that the role of the leader there is is um, is uh, probably three elements of it <coughs> I mean the first thing is is to really have uh, to, to have that vision of where you're going so you know to to be able to paint a picture to people of of uh, of the journey that we're going to go down and and uh, you know to get that passion um, into into that vision and to get people a bit a bit a bit fired up about that. I think the the second role um, is, and I, I like to, to 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 say to my own you, you know my own team is talk about to thinking about going through the jungle and and trying to get to to a place say to somewhere where there's water. And my role as as the leader really is to have that big uh, machete and, and cut the bushes down so that the, the team behind me that are delivering. Are delivering the goods, delivering the functions, delivering the contracts, delivering the outcomes, can charge on behind. So you know, really, to be that that one clearing the way, and that might be about making the connections within the organisation with the people who need to be the enablers, or that might be about uh, setting the policy framework for the way that we're going. And I think the final role is is around being the cheerleader when when success happens as well. And you know, one of the the things that happened to us as a team is that we were we were successful in in, in winning a couple of, of trophies this year and um, one at Scottish level and one at UK level and you know imagine the effect that that has on a, on a group of of nine people that work at the top left of the the UK weather map in the outer hebrides that actually all that work that they've done has has meant something and that there's recognition now obviously it's different in different organisations. In, in, in a commercial sector, you might not have these things. But trying to be the cheerleader and get recognition for people as you move down that change, I think, is a really important role of leadership. And it's not about it's not about you, but it's about getting getting that team a bit of confidence as well. So before I turn to Andrew, just tell us what, what is the machete cutting down? What, where are the the obstacles that need to be removed in your experience of local government? What, what are you hacking back? <coughs> <laughs> well, in, in, in a period of purdah, then perhaps we <laughs> probably don't need to mention the politicians. But I think it's just, you know, in any change in organisation or in any any move forward, there are always, you know, there are always blockers. So it might be a, a senior manager from a different function. It might be the rules which we, we, we work under. It might be the, the, the technology, you know, the, the procurement, the procurement and so on that, that the whole function sits on. So it's it's yeah. it's different. It's horses for courses, but it's it's about you know m finding that way to help your team make it happen, and not accepting that things are going to to stand in the way. And and, and you know, a big part of that is about people, obviously, and, and forging those relationships and being able to to get people to to give your team a chance, I suppose, to do something different as well. Thank you, Helen. Andrew, what, what's your spin on this? 
Uh, yeah, my, uh, my belief is the role of the leader is um, to set belief within the individuals that you work with. Um, Siggy spoke a lot about yeah. the psychological aspects of success, and I'm a, a big fan of that. And having worked for 10 years in um, placing CPOs, and in the last 12 months actually heading up an organisation that does more than just procurement, it works across the, uh, the C-suite, what's become clear to me is that actually when you meet um, C-suite people from other professions, I, the, the feeling I get is they actually have more belief in what they're doing than the average CPO does. And I think that's a big gap for the procurement industry is to further believe in what you're doing. Because if, if you don't believe it, um, then I don't think you can lead other people to believe it either. Do you have a view as to why this is a particular issue? Oh, yeah, procurement? legacy. Uh, uh, the legacy <laughs> is what that's making... Um, of procurement is. being a transactional function yes. that's um, a, you know, a dumping ground yes. historically for people uh, from other professions, whereas uh, it's obviously a huge opportunity when, when deployed at the right level. So, yeah, so I, th I think imparting that belief will also allow you to pass the machete over to people in your own team <laughs> uh, to uh, get through some of the tropical tundraage and deliver the results you need. Thank you, Andrew, very wise. Now, Sarah, you mentioned uh, some of the frisson between uh, HR and procurement. I guess it is around, to some extent, legacy or a different mm -hmm. perspective on which each function is trying to achieve yeah. and perhaps <laughs> the friction between them. Is there something there that... Uh, well, I think, I mean, I mean obviously, I can, I can speak in a more <coughs> informed way about HR, I guess, but I, th I think it's a brand um, challenge, really. You know, and, you know, perception is real, isn't it? Because, I mean, <laughs> if that's how people perceive you internally or externally, then that's the way it is. So I think shifting that perception, um, and I, I mean, I have, you know, you probably gathered already, I have quite strong views about things. You know, I think we're all in it together. We're all in it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And HR, actually, probably, I don't know, maybe it has an even worse reputation, you know, in, in big organisations. But we're all here for the same purpose. We're all here to deliver those business outcomes. But we bring something different to the party um, and do things in different ways. So I think it's about shifting that and, uh, and about um, working very collaboratively. And I have now got a knot in my hanky. If I ever now work with some procurement people, I'm going to be well cool. Yeah. <laughs> it was quite, you know, yeah. so... Hold out the olive Yes, that's, that's right, true. yeah. Because um, we're all leaders, aren't we? Trying to deliver, you know, get, get through the jungle. We're all trying to do that. And working collaboratively with the machetes, that is such a great programme, isn't it, the island? <laughs> Working collaboratively has to be the way forward, doesn't it? That's and because right. every functional conference, I was at an IT conference the other day, and there is a belief in the IT community their voice isn't heard. They're yeah. the back office. They're yeah. not making the difference they could. Yeah. They're undervalued. You have this in HR conferences. Yeah. Uh, marketing uh, will always say that their voice is the quietest in the organisation. The only, the, o the, o the, only the only, fun the only function that never is Chris's. The only function that never finance. uses this finance. victimhood language is finance, mm -hmm. and it's quite interesting. That is it because finance, it's the language of business. It's the language of of money and and, and cash and and shareholder value, or is it that actually <coughs> finance have a psychological mindset that's perhaps a bit more grown up, uh, perhaps a bit more self-confident, perhaps founded on professional standards or finer levels of recruitment or a certain degree of pride. I don't know. Siggy, do you have a, a view on this as to why it's so difficult to get collaboration across the functions, even on board, especially at board level? There are very few boards I've worked with that could be regarded as teams in any yeah. real sense of the word. <clears throat> They're different party interests fighting one another, in a sense. So it goes right up the system. Siggy, what's your experience of this? I think to a large extent I pretty much agree with everything that um, um, Sarah and, and um, the other folks mentioned and you, you hit the nail on the head there. It is true, I share that perspective that finance is the only function that doesn't seem to suffer a uh, lack of functional self-confidence or in our case I'd go as fast as say sometimes an identity crisis and my opinion um, is that it's because um, whether or not we like to admit it, in the capitalist world, we all worship at the altar of dollars. Yeah. And dollars is the language of business. Yeah. Even if you're in the charity sector or in the public sector, yeah. we still count in terms of uh, dollars. So, you know, um, it's understandable in some senses. 
And then they have the legacy issues that Andrew referred to. And um, at the risk of annoying a few people, apologies, David, but I, do, I will be honest. I remember earlier in my career, procurement was where you saying to the guys who weren't performing. Um, we have come a long way from then. Um, and it's been helped by many of the organizations that are trying to do pioneering things in procurement. Um, sadly, they tend to be the large businesses who tend to have the balance sheets to invest in, in, in talent, invest in helping people think differently, invest in helping people appreciate this multifunctional uh, um, perspective. But the truth is that if you look at most developed societies, the vast majority of us don't work in large businesses who have the big balance sheets. We work in SMEs who can afford that. Yeah. So there, there are truths in everything that everybody has said. There's a legacy thing. There's the leadership capability thing. There's the kind of, you know, yeah. the fact that, you know, we might not be the guy speaking the dollar language. And maybe that's one of the things that I think we need to do in procurement. One of the, my key messages to procurement people is you've got to understand what the enterprise priorities are. We're not here to do procurement. We're here to serve a business. That's got to be number one. This is the moment to, to throw it open. Who would like to uh, join in the conversation? make an argument for a, either from an experience or a fresh perspective. So it's interesting looking at uh, finance and using it as a reference point. Um, you could also say that finance hasn't changed, so the rest of the business has had to change. Um, and in the nicest way, maybe I'm getting it wrong, Chris will slap me one. Um, <laughs> there is a risk that actually as more big companies fail that the fact that finance hasn't had to change could be the reason why large organisations yeah. do fail. Um, and we're seeing it, you know, there's all the stats that only 15% of the SP500 will be there in yeah. Yeah. 15, 15 years' time. Now, maybe releasing some of the, the huge cash hoards that they, they have and yeah. changing the way the business works and also how they, they do that with the internal people and yeah. with the suppliers is going to be the core to the change. So I wouldn't put finance up yeah. there as an ambassador of, of what good looks like. I think sales, marketing, uh, HR has had to have the change. The procurements are changing yeah. with this growth in terms of the collaboration with suppliers and the opportunities there. So I say finance is probably the, the next big part. And actually, that will be the failure of a lot of organisations, not the success. So I'll, I'll challenge yeah. finance to be in a good benchmark. There. And Jules, can I just say Jinx personal padlock? Because I was about to say exactly that same thing. And going back to what you said earlier, you, can you think about Gen Y people working in finance? <coughs> they ain't going to do it. It's, it's hierarchical. It's all about power. They want to work differently. So I think, of, of course, it has been very successful, but going into the future it won't work because hierarchies are, are going out, by yeah. the way, and engagement is in, and flat structures, and leaving your, your back window open and all that jazz, and they're going to struggle with that change, although they do hold the power on the money, which I is... I don't think that's true, true at all, sorry, but... My daughter's 25, and, and more of her friends have gone off to become accountants than any other profession. Yeah. It doesn't seem to be putting them off. I mean, there is a generation X, Y, whatever. But, you know, but do you not think, um, do you not think, I mean, to, a bit of a confession to make here, you know, I'm one of these second generation procurement people in my first <laughs> career, I was an accountant. <laughs> and I think that, that uh, okay, yeah, you, you might want to go into, into finance and you see that as something that's, it's uh, secure, it's where the money is, blah de blah but actually, you know, m people want to do things that are, are, are meaningful and creative and, and that add value. And if, you know, I think about my colleagues in finance in my own organisation that, you know, you can't hear the word of, of, of anybody speaking, it's just the calculators going. Um, whereas in procurement, we're out there engaging with, with, uh, yeah. with the departments, we, we, we're having to be innovative, we're having to, to do different things. Okay, there's the sort of technical side of it, but for, for, younger, for the younger generation that want a career that does involve <coughs> something that's a bit different, you know, finance isn't the place at all. And, 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 and so that, I, I, although I, I can see where they're going, actually they might be people like me that come over 
to procurement eventually because they want well, procurement's they not want more. more finance. Not <laughs> 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 yeah. and also, it's, it's a profession, and it is it is it is well re remunerated, isn't it? And that's you know that's yeah. the transition we're at at the moment. That it would never have crossed my mind to have been in procurement, whereas it's my you know my natural resting place. It's where I should be. So, I think more people will find that. Can I just add something? I, I do, despite what I said earlier, and I think it's important. Um, certainly, my observations are that things have changed, and things are changing. Perhaps they are not as the change is not as fast as we would like, and not as widespread as we would like. But if I think about when I started my career, um, and even in the midpoint of my career, just the mere fact that we're here today, talking mm -hmm. about what we're talking about. And the fact that people, we are now exploiting technology. Thank you very much, uh, beautiful guys of procurers. So, you know, there are going to be thousands of people that are going to listen to this discussion. I know we get the cogs in their heads turning. Um, I was at another uh, uh, activity um, yesterday and another one the week before. So these discussions are taking place. And it's those sorts of discussions that sometimes open our minds about you know, possibilities. One of the organizations I was talking to yesterday was fascinating listening to the category managers. Um, I, I, you know, I gave a talk and then I sat down and they were talking about some of their recent activities. And what I heard and what I saw was heartwarming. I did get up and give a couple of them kisses. And uh, because I was proud, I was proud of the change in perspective. Rather than coming to the table with a kind of yeah, procurement, 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 procurement. They were describing how they got working with their internal customers. They were using the kind of terminology I like to talk about. You know, and some of them were in the places that we often struggle to get in the door. One of them was marketing. You know, marketing guys do like just going and talking mm. to these sexy creative agencies. And the procurement guy, yeah, that's you. <laughs> the procurement category lady, the French lady, um, described how she approached the engagement it wasn't that I want to come and sit between you and your sexy creatives. I want to sit beside you. I want to sit beside you. And, you know, she described the engagement with questions. You know, this guy who's been here, the same supplier, the same creative agency, how much is it costing our business? We throw everything at him. You know, do we ever check the value we're getting from him? And it was fascinating. I hear more of those kind of stories, which to me reflected different thinking different perspective about our role and I think that that reflects changes and you will see that also if you look at some of the comments and the posts on social media so yes we do have some you know legacy challenges some of it is to do with you know leadership as well but it, it's it's uh, it's true to say that there is change happening there are a lot more procurement people who are recognizing that we need to be business people in the supply management game rather than supply managers. So before we break, let's just check. How many of us think, hands up, those who think that in procurement we're progressing in the right direction? Yeah, strong share of support. Those who are more skeptical as to whether progress is being made at the right pace? Yeah, two or three, yeah, interesting. I think it's time to break, isn't it? We deserve a coffee, yeah, don't we?